How did Satan deceive Eve? He got her to question her identity. What did he do? God just knows that if you eat this, you'll be like him. They were already like him. They didn't need to do anything to prove that they were. They already were. When Satan tempted Jesus, who was in the wilderness, he said, if you are the son of God, then change these stones into bread. Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Yes, it's scripture, but it's what Jesus heard. Because the last voice he heard before he went into the wilderness was his father saying, this is my son. So Satan is completely after your identity and you never coming to the reality of who you really are as a son. And if you're a son and God's your father, then you're uncondemnable. Do you know that it's possible to prophesy and heal the sick and be condemned in your heart? And to put on a happy face when people are around you, but inside be tormented. This sounds like a strong word, but it's not. It's just a keep you okay word. See, God will... God will flow through anybody, but you have to be a steward of your own heart. God will flow through you because he loves people. He will touch people around you because he loves people. But you have to have Holy Spirit as your mentor weeding your own garden. So, see, there's this spirit of increase on the earth, but it's very important that we know who we are in the midst of every situation in every trial that we're in so that we respond Christ-like so that people actually want what we have. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not okay for a Christian to get squeezed and everything manifests but Christ. When you squeeze an apple into a cup, you get apple juice. If you squeeze an orange into a cup, you get orange juice. If I squeezed an orange into a cup and you drank it and it was apple juice, you would freak out. It should be equally as strange that when a Christian gets squeezed, everything but Jesus comes out. It's one thing to praise God. It's another thing to have everybody around you watch your life praising God. I totally love the worship and, the, and you guys were excited and it's awesome. I'm for that stuff. Who are you on Monday morning? Who are you in your workplace? Come on, man. The reality of this thing is that if it's just here and the presence is only here, we're in trouble. But if you're a carrier of the presence everywhere you go, we want to be carriers. We want to be dominated. We want to be possessed by God in such a way that people cannot get out of what we have. People need to know about the God that you worship because of the life that you live. To be a light is amazing because darkness is never the issue. It's always the absence of light. But if a believer knows who they are, if you're the only one at your workplace that knows you're a Christian, you might just be a basket-headed one. That's not a bad word. That's a big word and a very important word because God said, no basket. It says the eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eye is single, your whole body is full of light. If you come into the kingdom to get blessed and God doesn't show up, to bless you, you might have a beef with God. God wants to bless us, but God blesses identity. God will bless the world before he blesses a selfish church. That's not a bad word. That's reality. Are you with me? This is like awesome. Because Jesus was selfless. And so we're supposed to follow him. Selfless. Meaning, how do you overcome the devil? The blood of the lamb, the word of your testimony, and you love not your own life unto death. And that's the kicker. It doesn't say deny the devil, pick up your cross and follow him. It doesn't. It's not in there. See, the devil's already been denied. If, if the highest part of hell is beneath the lowest part of us, then why do we rebuke the devil? Why would I pay attention to him since he's already behind me? Why would I tell him to get behind me when he already is? Why wouldn't I see who I am 
in the midst of every circumstance. If you're ever squeezed by your circumstance and you manifest anything but Jesus, you, you fail to see who you are in the midst of it. It is possible for you to live your life in an unoffended place. And I have the great privilege of telling you that I've been born again for seven and a half years and have never been offended. I don't carry offense, I carry the cross. You can't carry both. This sounds like it's such far out stuff like, whoa, that's crazy. No, that's amazing. I've never held aught against anybody. Do you know that when you do, you actually say, well, they'll get what they deserve, and then you deserve hell. Because all of us don't deserve heaven. None of us did anything to work our way there. Jesus did the work. That's what he did. He worked, fulfilled the law so that he could give us something. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become something. And when we realize what we've become, then the light that we carry is the light from what we've become. And it's impossible for you to cover the basket over top of the light. It'll burn off. It's incredibly amazing. You, you know, man, I, 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 everywhere I go, people are like, you. they look at me like, uh, uh, in, in the U.S. we have a saying, that a deer in the headlights. Like they're... <laughs> Serious, like I, you, that guy, he's out of his mind. And I say, no, I'm not. I'm out of yours. Yeah. For real. For real. I'm not out of my mind. I believe the gospel. I have my mind set on things above. You're not allowed to be in your mind. It's illegal in the kingdom. If you think that you're going to give people a piece of your mind, you need born again. Because that's not okay. It's not okay to use an excuse to remain bound. Well, you know, they, they treated me this way or they did this. To, you, you don't know how they treated me. No, you don't know what we did to Jesus. We elevate our experience. We elevate our issues. We elevate our problems above what Jesus Christ did. And you're wrong. Come on, listen. God magnified His Word above His own name. Yeah. Psalms 138 verse 2 said, You, O Lord, have magnified Your Word above Your name. He thinks really highly of it. And any time, any time you take your experience and magnify it above God's Word, you're doing the same thing that Satan did before he was kicked out of heaven. And I'm not saying you're going to be kicked out of heaven. But what I am saying is Satan cannot come up into heaven and dethrone God. But he sure is good at dethroning God from the soul of man. He can't come up into heaven and say, I'm kicking you out, God. He already tried to get above God and God said, Poop, and put him here. I don't even know if he did that. The finger of God. Seriously. I don't even know if he did that. All I know is that he put him here for a purpose. And then he created us for the purpose that he put him here. God gets good pleasure out of watching his people destroy the enemy. And so many times we're maneuvered and manipulated and pottered and squeezed by circumstances and issues of life because we fail to see who we are. What did Jesus really pay a price for? Did he pay a price to just get you to heaven? He paid a price to get heaven into you. If we position ourselves inside to have revival meetings, listen carefully. If we position ourselves inside to have revival meetings, and I don't believe that's what you're doing, but if we do, and have people come to our tent, or come to our building to get born again, or just to get, or to get healed, and then lead them to the Lord, we don't understand what the word salvation really means. We don't understand what the word saved really means. The word saved doesn't mean go to heaven. The word saved means saved, healed, delivered, protected, made whole, kept safe and sound to, to, be, safe, to be kept safe from harm. The word salvation, saved, healed, delivered, protected, pretty similar words. If I get people born again to just pray a prayer, what I've done is I've positioned them to look and wait for Jesus' return. And they're like, God, get me out of here. The world is getting worse. It's terrible. My family, my life, my job, my, 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 my. It's terrible. Jesus, get me out of here to heaven with me and to hell with everybody else. 
You are not just saved to get to heaven. You put off your life, you take on a new one. And you never visit the old one because it's dead. See, sometimes this is hard because we've psychologically brought Christianity in and made it a way that seems right to a man. And that's not okay. See, I, I heard you talking about the strongholds. Man, my only belief system on strongholds is that they exist here. Because I don't believe there's any stronghold that's big enough to stop my Jesus. And He lives in me. So when I go to a place that's really dark, if the strongholds are cleared out of here, I just got an open heaven everywhere I go. I just believe that. With all, I, that's the only way I know. Why? Because I've been in the darkest of situations and God manifests because He loves people. And the darker the situation and the angrier the aggressors are and the meaner the people are, God says, this is a good place for me to prepare a table for you. Let's sit down right here and have a meal together. Come on, as dark as it is, how can it stop light? One person in Christ is the majority. It's not a million devils and one Jesus and ooh boy, we're in trouble. It's not a million devils and one Christian, ooh boy, we're in trouble. Unless you fail to see who you are. Because if you fail to see who you are, the eye, the lamp of your body isn't single. It's double and there's darkness. And if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness. I asked you if you were ready. Really, honestly, this is truth. I'm given the scripture, I'm given the word, I'm bringing it, and I haven't even got to Peter. Because this is really good news. It's good tidings of great joy. God is really happy with what he did. It's, it's crazy because the prophets prophesied and said, Jesus is coming. They prophesied, they saw it, and they were so thankful that they saw it, and they couldn't have it. And they were grateful that they saw it, and now we have it, and I'm afraid that we don't know what we really have. Because if we did, there'd be no condemnation. None. It's illegal. It's from hell. Satan's the only one that has the right to be condemned. He's the only one severed, the only one cut off, the only one that is hopeless, the only one that should be depressed, the only one that should be angry, bitter. Come on. Yes. He's eternally cut off. There's no hope for him. Depressed, angry, bitter, unforgiveness, hopeless, no chance. And he's trying to reproduce himself in the soul of man. There are two seeds trying to reproduce themselves. It says in the beginning, when man fell, it said to, God said to Adam and Eve, He said, the seed from this woman, capital S, the seed from this woman is going to crush the head of your seed, little s. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So there are seeds trying to reproduce themselves after their own kind. And the attack point isn't your job. The attack point is the soul of man. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't mind you going to revival. He doesn't mind you going to church. He doesn't mind you singing. All of those things are great. But he's very, very, very petrified of you finding out who you are when you do these things. Do you hear my heart? I'm not putting down prophecy because it is a byproduct of sonship. I'm not putting down healing. I walk in it. I walk in prophecy. I walk in wisdom. I, I walk in all of them. Because they're all mine. God would never say, well, you can't have this one. No, if you, the only reason you wouldn't have them is because you failed to surrender your life. Once you give your life, the Holy Spirit sees fit to put His there. Come on, Jesus didn't rely upon gifting. Did Jesus rely upon the gift of prophecy? Did He rely upon the gift, the gift of knowledge? Or did He rely upon the Holy Spirit? Okay, the sevenfold Spirit of God, the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of wisdom. All of that stuff was on the Lord Jesus Christ. And my Bible says, and your Bible says in Romans 8, 11, that the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in me. I've never been taught on gifting. I've never been taught on any of that stuff. I don't need to. 
My Bible says it's all mine. I'm not against teaching on gifting. I just have never been taught. And I've walked in all of them. But if I'd have been taught, someone might have told me that this isn't mine. Well, who is a man to tell me that it's not mine when Jesus says it's all mine? I'm not coming against anything because I don't know anything to come against. I'm just preaching the raw truth, man. The only truth that I know. The truth that set me free. I'm so free from me that I'm free from you. I'm free from me. I'm so free from me, I'm free from you. That means that I don't love you to hear you tell me you love me back. I don't need you to love me back for me to feel good about first saying it to you. God didn't say, I love you, and say, boy, I hope they tell me they love me back because I'd feel really insecure if they don't. But we've been trained and cultivated by the very enemy of God. All of our life, we've been trained that way. All of our life. So God says it's really important that we be renewed in the spirit of our mind. God says it's really, I probably don't need a microphone. Is there any difference? Awesome. It's like the day that Peter preached 3,000 people. Do you need me to hold this? It's okay. It's all right. Can you hear it down here? Can you still pick it up? You can't. Oh, bummer. Sorry. Okay, go. It's okay. Gosh. He's really good. See, when I came up and I start to talk, very sober. And then the Holy Spirit says, hey, passion. I try so hard sometimes to be quiet. I can't do it. He loves people. The gospel should never be known by its doctrine. It's by its passion. It's not okay for you to look just like the world. And I'm not saying that you've got to flake out and be freaky. I'm telling you that you need to be naturally supernatural. We need to become so heavenly minded that we're earthly incredible. Amen. So we're on our jobs. We're doing our jobs as unto the Lord and our priorities to do our job as unto God. But that doesn't interfere with Holy Spirit touching everybody. Are you with me? Some people say, well, you don't know where I work. Well, you don't know who you are. I'm not being mean, I'm being real. Uh, it doesn't matter where you work. Jesus is Lord. That's right. And if he's Lord, he wants to touch people. He just chose to use us to do it. Amen. What a privilege. What a grace. What an amazing time it is. You guys okay? Yeah. Okay. Let me really try to get in here. <sighs> Jesus. Let me just read. So good. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of Dispersia and Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for the sprinkling, for the obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Gosh. Grace to you and peace be with you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us, has given us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an incorruptible, or to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though through a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to the praise and glory or honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
Whom having not seen you love, though now you do see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating that he testified before him the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed and not to themselves but to us. They were ministering the things that now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels desire to look into. Therefore... Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We've put this far off in the place where it says the revelation of Jesus Christ thinking that the day that he comes back. But I would like to tell you that it's the day that your heart sees the revelation of Christ. It's really important. Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and and rest your hope fully upon the grace that's to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it's written, be holy for I am holy. Wow. That's crazy. Oh my goodness, that's crazy stuff. Okay. I'm going to go. I'm, yeah. Yeah. So good. Do you, do you know how good this is right here? Oh my goodness. Do you know that the gospel is impossible without Jesus? Do you know that it's impossible when you're reading the word to have it come alive without Holy Spirit? Do you know that we really need a deeper relationship with Holy Spirit? Not looking to people to be our mentor, but allowing Holy Spirit to be our mentor? Wow. Sometimes we go after the fact of someone's life that they've been without a father and the reason they are the way they are is because they've been without a father not realizing that God is their father. And we think that we need to put a spiritual father in place in order for them to be normal but the gospel doesn't say I won't leave you as orphans I'll give you spiritual fathers. Spiritual fathers are awesome, but if God your father isn't first priority, you will always need your spiritual father in order to be free. And that's not good. That's codependency, and that's very dangerous. A spiritual father can, you can glean from, he can pour into you, but if you depend upon him to make you free, he's not your savior, Jesus Christ is. And if you need somebody to be your mentor to keep you accountable, they'll never be around you all the time, so you'll never be able to be held accountable. is really important because if Holy Spirit isn't set up as your mentor you will always always need somebody around in order to keep you free it's good to grow with somebody it's wrong to grow with somebody without Holy Spirit discipleship is awesome but discipleship without personal ownership of Holy Spirit is wrong any spiritual father will tell you that you need God to be your father. If not, that spiritual father likes to have lots of kids. But if the spiritual father guides you into a place where God is your father, they're a father to begin with. And a son. Mothers too. Are you with me still? This is shaky stuff, man. Because what, and no, I'm not saying it, it is because it's totally scriptural. It's totally the word of God. There's really no way out of it. In our, in our want to help people, we've tried to put people in place in order to make people stronger. And I understand that. So it's not like we're meaningful in trying to deceive people. That's not it at all. We want to help people. But sometimes programs exist because and suddenly don't. I don't know if I can. Sometimes we have lots of programs because we want people free. 
and we exalt the program above the end suddenly, thinking, well, if God wants to, he will, instead of believing God that he's gonna. Do you understand that the disciples of the early days couldn't have functioned without this? And we're pretty good at functioning without it. I'm not being mean. I'm being real. You have the ability to hunger and thirst and be filled because all of God's promises are yes and in Him. Amen. Amen. In the Sermon on the Mount, which is called the Beatitudes, which is not the do attitudes, it's the be attitudes. <laughs> it's the attitudes of being. Be attitudes. It's not the attitudes of doing. In order to have the Sermon on the Mount walked out in your life, you have to be to do. Blessed are the meek. Come on, this is really huge. Blessed are those who mourn. When you mourn, you don't feel blessed. So if you live by doing, you'll live by feeling. But if you live by being, see this changes everything because what we're doing is we're living from the finished work. We're not living towards it. We're living from victory. We're not living toward it. I'm not interceding through the breakthrough to break through the second heaven to get to the third. I'm seated in the third and I break through from a place of rest. I don't war and spiritually war in a place and get worn out. And if you are, it's because you're shadow boxing with the enemy. And we call it contending. I'm not against warfare because it's constant. But the weapons of our warfare aren't carnal, but are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. But we've taken that and stopped there instead of reading the next part that says the strongholds are in our mind. And we take every thought captive. So all of a sudden, our soul receives salvation, which is the finishing of your faith. What if we finished that first and moved on? I'm not make, I'm not trying, I, I don't want this to be something that's complicated. The Bible says, don't think it's weird that you face these various trials. If need be, for the purifying of your faith. It's tested by fire. It purifies your faith. But if you fail to see who you are in the midst of the trial, you will scream and burn and smell like smoke and you will face a constant trial instead of various. This is brand new stuff. Really, I'm, I'm hearing it as I'm sharing it with you. But I live it. I'm really serious. I, my dad is amazing. And you got the same one. And it's time that we know who our dad is. It's really important. You have no idea. I'm passionate, but I'm crying inside. You don't, don't know. Because I'm, I'm not here to lash out. I, I can't stand the devil. This thing is simple. We've believed lies. And it's not okay to believe a lie. It empowers the liar. And he's eternally condemned forever. And I'm sick and tired of watching Christians be condemned. Because he paid the price. Jesus did not come in the world to condemn it. But through him, the world might be saved, healed, delivered, protected, made whole, kept safe and sound. Are you still okay? This is really good. See, a lot of you don't know where I came out of. But I didn't go to school. I went to my Bible. And he set me free from me. This is really awesome. Why would people want the Jesus that you say you have if they can never see the Jesus that, they say you ha that you say you have in your life manifested? Why would they want what you have if every time you face stuff, you look like what you're facing? And I, I'm not preaching something that's unattainable. 
be very careful about preaching anything that you haven't walked out because you will be tested and there will be fire. See, I've woken up and said, go ahead, squeeze away. I, uh, since the day I've got, since the time I've gotten and given my life to Jesus, I've said, God, I'm asking anything in my life that needs to be shaken to shake it and break anything that needs to be broken. Father, I thank you that you're the gardener and Jesus is the vine and I'm the branch and I'm asking you to prune away, God. I want to be a short, bushy tree, one that bears much fruit because my fruit's going to remain because you said you want my fruit to remain. And the most amazing thing is that when you live this way, the seed is in your fruit. So everywhere you go, it reproduces after the same kind. See, that's, that's really what we want to do. Do you ever see a, a forest? Just do you know that it started with just one? And then like a squirrel might have got a hold of it. We have a lot of acorn trees like in, in America and, and a squirrel comes and grabs an acorn and buries it and another tree comes and all these acorns are dropping and then they're going out and burying them and all of a sudden <laughs> and that's what it's supposed to look like in a Christian's life and in their family in their marriage and their jobs to where family members can't resist the love of God. Because you're not here to point out their faults and failures. You're here to point out their goodness. Because it doesn't take a man of God to point out the bad in people. It takes one to pull out the gold and what the world says is nothing. Jesus was given the ministry of reconciliation. And that same ministry has been given to us. Well, I don't see people that way. Change the way you think. Because if you look in the mirror and you see yourself the way that God created you, you will love God with everything you are, and then you will be able to love your neighbor as you love yourself. But if you don't understand or realize your identity, every time you look in the mirror, you don't see Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see your faults and your failures and the things you wish you never did. But Jesus paid a price to crush what you wish you never did so that you could get to who He created you to really be. It's good preaching. It is. It's not, and it's not just, oh well, it's not just some doctrine that I've come up here to share. I promise you it's the Word of God. It really is. It's not, it's not a prayer that sets you free. It's the truth that sets you free. I've watched lots of people set free. And suddenly... But the truth will keep you free. Yeah. It's one thing. It's one thing to get prayer and emotionally feel better. It's another thing to have truth in you so that when that lie tries to whisper back, it has no access to your soul. Yeah. Hear that again. It's one thing to have a momentary time of freedom to where you feel better emotionally. It's another thing that when the lie comes back, there's a no occupancy sign on your soul. To where your soul is so set up, you're so set up in truth that when it tries to come back, it has no access point because you're free. And when it says, yeah, well, you shouldn't have never done that. You should have, well, you should have never said that. Yeah, well, remember when this happened to you when you were little? Come on, that stuff's just a toy for the devil to play with. I'm serious. If you're born again, that stuff doesn't exist in your life. It's not a voice that's inside trying to get out. It's a voice that's outside trying to get back in. Truth needs to set up its camp in the soul of man so that when it tries to whisper, it has no access point. Come on, it says when a strong man guards a house, it remains. But if a stronger one comes in, tell me what's stronger than the Word of God. Tell me what's stronger than the truth and grace of God. Nothing. When a strong man guards a house, it remains. But if a stronger one comes in, it strips the armor, takes it out. And it goes and it looks for more, for, for places, and it finds that it can't find any. So it comes back to see if the place is swept clean. We use it as a picture of deliverance. I get it. But my Bible says that I have been delivered. So when you say yes to God, and you say I do, He says I am. 
but the finished work isn't enforced and the blood of Jesus isn't understood. So Satan still has access to our soul. He wants to reproduce himself in here. He wants to get you thinking and going through hell headed to heaven. And once in a while you need to reach out because you need to feel good about yourself and touch somebody. That's not okay. Because we can use miracles and prophecy to get into works again. It's scary. God wants to flow through you, but you have to be a steward of your own heart. And you have to find out that God is your Father. We have to understand the finished work. There's a reason why the blood of Jesus is everything. Come on, God said, I am going to do something that's going to change everything. I'm going to take a covenant that's not working. Because he found fault with the people in Hebrews 8, it says. So I'm going to give them a new and better covenant. One that's really easy. But if they make it technical, they won't believe. So therefore they won't enter. Their soul will bang itself. Their heart is yes, but their mind is... You have all these voices. I keep hearing all these stuff. Stop it! In these last days, Jesus has spoken. It says in past days, He spoke through the prophets and the law. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. Come on, this is really, really good. I want the CD of this. I do. It's awesome. Because it's truth. It's what makes us free. This is all I know, man. And I'm free. And I'm seven and a half years old and I'm free. It doesn't matter how long you've been in the church. You cannot unlearn what you've learned. You need to be renewed. You can't spend time relearning. You will use it as a crutch to stay back here looking at people saying, well, you're lucky I didn't come in that way. Stop it. Establish relationship with God. And allow Holy Spirit to breathe on what you have. Amen. Don't use it as something to remain bound in. You cannot unlearn. Your mind is built to be renewed, not unlearn. He gave you a mind to learn. So don't have to unlearn. You can't. You'll spend all your time trying to backtrack. Just go to the simplicity of the gospel. Allow what Jesus did, the finished work, to really say it's finished in your soul. And when something comes and says it's to be continued, remind it that it's finished. Come on, so that thing comes back seven times worse. It does. With seven other lies. Seriously, I get this picture. You got, you got the devil, and I believe he's busy. So he sends a little imp out. Really, this is what I see. So I'm living my life. I'm walking. I'm born again. I'm spirit-filled. I, I love God. And I'm living my life, and all of a sudden, this, this jab comes. And it says, well, you should have never, never said that. And, I, and, and then here's what we do. I rebuke you, devil. I command you, get behind me, Satan. And we do that. And as soon as you shut your mouth, it's back again. Why? Because that's not how we cast down that stuff. We cast it down with truth. Listen very carefully. Since the beginning of my life, when something said, when Satan doesn't mess, he doesn't talk to me. He's just done, dude. It just makes me freak out in God. I don't even rebuke him. Ever. There's two things I don't worry about. One of them's the devil and one of them's sin. Why? Because I don't wake up to miss it. I'm in love with the king. I'm serious. If I trip, if I slip, I quickly thank God for who I really am. And he cleanses me from all unrighteousness, which means only righteousness remains. I don't spend time in my trip. It's over. If, if I trip, oh, oh. I don't go, oh no, I need to call five people to help me get back on my feet. This is about a personal relationship. I'm not against the body of Christ because I'm all about unity. I'm against having to need people to keep me free. When it's the Son that sets me free. It says, call no one on earth your father, for you have one father. Call no one on earth your teacher, for you have one teacher. You need nobody to teach you. For the anointing teaches you all things that are true. 1 John 2.27 
That doesn't mean don't listen to teachers. That just means set up relationship with the Holy Spirit so that you're never deceived. Because He teaches you all things that are true. He's the internal governor of righteousness inside of you. Hebrews 5.12 says that, you know what? By this time you ought to be a teacher. That's what he says. That's what it says in Hebrews 5. By this time you ought to be a teacher. But you need somebody to take you back to the very first principles and oracles of God. And you need milk instead of solid food. For solid food is for those who have been trained in righteousness. Righteousness is a word that... That is, that is blurted out, but rarely understood. The understanding of righteousness is that God settled everything. All 613 laws, all 10 commandments, all of them, Jesus fulfilled in righteousness when he got baptized. John said, I can't baptize you. Jesus said, you have to. It's necessary so that righteousness gets fulfilled. And when he went down in that river and came back up, the heavens were opened legally and never shut again. Really? And righteousness was given to Jesus. And God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Amen. And he was led into the wilderness and tempted and came back out with the Holy Ghost and power. The only wilderness that you're really allowed to be in is the one that you come out with, Holy Spirit and power. Amen. Be very careful. Because a lot of people are in a lot of wilderness and a lot of trials and a lot of stuff. But that's not your potter. If you see who you are in the midst of it, you'll come out with an amazing integrity, with an amazing love of God, with a purified faith in the, in the various trials, with a purifying of your faith, with your faith tested by fire. Come on, it's the truth. It's awesome. So in Hebrews 5.12, he says, you ought to be a teacher. You need someone to take you back to the basics. What's the basics? Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. First thing we do, seek the kingdom and His righteousness. Kingdom is amazing. It's huge. It's God's government and it rules and reigns from within. The kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So the kingdom is in the Holy Ghost. So seeking first the kingdom is seeking relationship with Holy Spirit in such a way to where we are totally entrenched in relationship with Holy Spirit. She is being set free. It's called truth. There's no way out. It's amazing what truth will do if you allow it in and say, well, I don't believe that. Shame on us for saying that. Sometimes we're like, well, that's not what I've been told. And you can't even open your heart and hear Jesus. And Jesus has come to set us free. You know that if you think you know it all, you're in trouble. Be very careful. Be very careful in allowing what, how you've been trained and how you've been taught to separate you. It's very scary because Jesus was right in front of them. And he said, you study the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. And it's these very scriptures that testify about me. And you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. Sometimes we can be so learned that we can't even hear the word of God. It's, it's crazy. That for a season, God's allowed the thinking and the tradition of man to shut down the most powerful thing in the world. It's really good. I'm not saying that's you. Your heart knows if it is. It's okay. I believe totally that I'm here and you're hearing me and you can't get out of this. I don't care if you leave now. Really, because God wants us to be free from each other so that we don't get pottered by circumstance anymore. It's the gospel. It's why we're alive. We're alive to shine. If you can't see who you are in the midst of circumstance, you'll never manifest Jesus. Because the squeeze is on. It's true. You constantly face stuff. You don't invite it in. What door did I open, brother? No, it's the devil. He's a jerk. 
Well, what did you do to open this door? Nothing. I'm worse speaking. No, you must have done something. Knock it off and stop counseling people that way. Yeah. Start to teach people who they are. Yeah. So that when stuff comes, they're just like, come on, I know who I am. Bang. And they don't turn. They go forward. Because it's forcefully advancing, not retreating. Come on, the gospel shod with peace. Your shoes have peace on them. Do you know that in the day that they had the shoes that he's talking about, they had spikes that went down deep into the ground. So that when the enemy came, they couldn't be pushed back. Wow. So many times we go through so many different things and we manifest everything but Jesus there. And it is possible. Man, if we can't do this when we're not being persecuted, how are we going to do this when a gun's in your face? Deny him. I'm preaching truth, man. I promise you. You're like, well, I don't have that. I, I don't... I don't, I, I mean, he's hyper. No, I'm possessed. Yeah. I really am. I've given my, you see, you don't understand where I came out of, where I was. You don't understand what I've been through and where I've been. It, it's horrible. It was horrible. But that's not who I am, and I don't wear that, because that man's dead for real. Anytime you revisit your past apart from the blood of Jesus, you're asking a spirit of offense to come into your present tense and bear dead fruit in your present reality. I'm going to say that again because it's really easy. Anytime you revisit your past apart from the blood of Jesus and the testimony under what he's done, you're asking something that's dead to come alive and bear dead fruit in your present life. And you'll never get to who you are because you keep looking at things behind. And their rear view Christianity is illegal. It's really true. The only people that get violated with that are people that like to dig up people's past. We should never like to do that. It's actually raising the wrong dead. <clears throat> if we don't believe the finished work of what God did, we're in big trouble. If we don't believe it is finished, we will be shadow boxing with the enemy because most of our warfare is done on the other side of what is really finished. And God finished it. In Romans 8, it says, I'm persuaded that neither angels nor principalities nor powers nor life nor death nor things present nor things to come nor any other created thing shall be able to separate me from receiving the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Listen carefully. Angels, nor principalities, nor powers. Life can't separate you. Death can't separate you. Things present can't separate you. Things to come can't separate you. Your past isn't on that list. Because it has the ability to separate you from receiving the love of God. Because the finished work says that part's finished. Think with me. Angels, principalities, powers. Life, death, present, future. Your past is not on that list. You okay still? It's like a... <clears throat> Serious. People walk out of the meetings, they're like, what just happened? <laughs> really. But it's important because I believe, honestly, I, I just believe this. I believe that God... I believe that God has given us the ability, if you believe by faith, that the words that we speak, as long as they're the Word of God become both spirit and life when you speak them out and it goes right into the heart and changes a life. That's what you felt. I promise. You will see the fruit of it and you'll understand what I'm saying. Wow, well, I'll see it to believe it. You will. Because every tree reproduces after its own kind. 
I'm a good tree. So are you. You're a tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. And guess what a tree of righteousness, guess what kind of fruit a tree of righteousness plant, the, a tree of righteousness grows. In Romans 6 it says that righteousness bears its fruit unto holiness. Is that awesome? So I'm a righteous tree, the planting of the Lord. My roots go down deep into what? His love. And it sucks up nutrients from the Father. And then all of a sudden, if by chance I have a tree, if I have a branch on me that's not bearing fruit, God says, whoop, gets rid of it, and boom, two grow out. And I've invited him to do that. And when I read the word, I say, God, I'm asking you to cut me deep and to shake whatever needs shaking in my life, God. Do you know that David said, bless the Lord, O my soul? Do you know that he commanded his soul to bless the Lord? David was in the midst of lots of circumstances where it was like enemy time, war, people chasing him. Listen to his life. It was crazy, man. I mean, Saul wanted him dead, dude. David's hiding out. David's like, bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, bless the Lord. All that's within me, bless his name. It's time that we possess our soul. Because if you don't, the devil will. Are you okay? <laughs> Offer your body as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Romans 12.1 And be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I fear lest as Satan deceived Eve by his craftiness so your minds may be corrupted and taken away from the simplicity that's in the Christ. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and in all your ways acknowledge Him. Lean not on your own understanding and He will direct your paths. Wow, isn't that awesome? Do you know what's really cool? Is that when you lean not on your own understanding and you trust in the Lord with all your heart and your mind's not in charge but your heart is, do you know that every path you go down, God will be there with you? Sometimes we pray about God, where do you want us to go instead of going and knowing that He's with us? Sometimes we pray for a divine encounter instead of realizing that we are one. This is not that complicated. Jesus made it simple. Do you know that like I didn't come here to impress you? I really didn't. I came here just to pour out my heart and allow God to just talk to you. I don't want anything. I love you. I, like, I don't need you to say, wow, Todd, thank you. That was awesome. That's great. But what I need you to say, oh my gosh, God. This is amazing. Thank you, God. And take this to your house and say, Father, I thank you. God, I didn't see this, but now I do. God, thank God. I don't have to look at the way I've been taught and the way this happened and this happened and this happened. They meant the best by doing it. But Father, thank you that today you fathered me. And I can look forward and I can do this because it's easy because I am this. I don't have to perform to be accepted. I am accepted because you performed. I lived in Ephesians 1 for my first whole year of being born again, of being born again. My Bible, that I'm accepted in the Beloved. If I'm accepted by God in the Beloved, how can you take away what you didn't give me? Think with me. I'm around my family and they're not born again and they don't worship Jesus and they're just distraught and they're just angry and they're just bitter. And I walk away and say, boy, they rejected me. Get that thing off of you. That has nothing to do with you, nor you with it, because you've already been accepted by your Father, so your family can't take away what God gave you. God gave you your acceptance, not man. 
Come on, if I'm accepted by my father, if he's my dad, and he said yes, why don't I just say yes to him saying yes? Why do I have the reasons and excuses of why I can't? Why do I tell people I need to work on it? You can never work on it or you're being worked on. You submit, you surrender, you give up, you give him your life. And you realize that God's your father. And if God's your father, it doesn't matter what your father or mother did or didn't do. Doesn't matter. Well, my dad this or my mom this. What does that have to do now that I've been refathered? Because being born again means being fathered from above. And it even grows deeper being fathered from within. Because it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, which was a mystery that they couldn't even see. They could see but didn't understand. And now we have it. The mystery's been revealed. The cat's out of the bag. It's ours. Yay. It's awesome. They wanted it. These amazing prophets there. Man, they were they're scary. Do you remember Elijah? Dude. Mount Carmel? Kill them all. That was a crazy time. It was crazy. Ezekiel lifted up by his hair. Just That's got to be scary. Serious. And my Bible says that John the Baptist was the greatest of all of them. John the Baptist, the high watermark of the Old Testament prophets. That's what it says. Jesus said, John the Baptist was the greatest of these. Yet I say to you that he who is least in the kingdom is greater. Maybe we don't realize what we got. Come on, man. I'm just touching the tip of the iceberg and it's really good. It's awesome. It is. Stop being pottered by life. Stop being squished by your experiences and your stuff. Start to realize who you are so that you have something to give away so that when you're squeezed, Jesus comes out. Come on, it's a change of thought. It's a thinking. Repent doesn't mean just say you're sorry. Repent means you change the way you think. Repent. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus' first message. Imagine that. First words out of his mouth. He comes back. There's some people. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Wow. Is right. Repent. Change the way you think. I brought my world with me. It's in the Holy Spirit. It's the kingdom. But if you don't change the way you see things, you'll think what you see in the natural is superior to the world that I brought with me. And it's at hand. It's within your reach. But you've got to change the way you see things. And then he lived it. A barrage of craziness. And he says, you know what? He who believes in me, these same things I do, they're going to do. Because they're going to see what I see. When they see what I see, they're going to do what I do. And I'm not going to leave them as orphans. It's going to be awesome. I will send another. And the presence of me being with you is going to be far surpassed by the presence of me living in you. Come on, it's powerful stuff. Change your life if you let it. And you don't even have to be really excited about it. I love what you said, like, there's going to be many Todd Whites, but the reality of this is there's going to be many of the best you that God created you to be out there. Because God only made one me, and He only made one you, and He didn't duplicate it. Even if you're a twin, it's not the exact duplication. Everybody's different. God made you to be the best you that God created you to be. Come on, it's good. Some of you are still looking at me like saying, is this real? It is. It's real. Some of you are like shell-shocked, like... We're like, what did we get ourselves into? I'm preaching the truth, man. There is nothing about what I'm saying that you could dispute or debate. It's, unde it's undebatable because it's what God preached. It's His kingdom. It's the Word of God. It might not be the way you've learned it, but God will violate your mind to reveal your heart. He does. 
He violates the mind to reveal your heart. He's like, you're like, oh, 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 oh. It's like the sword gets you laughing and, oh, what was that? And, yeah, oh, so that you could no longer live. Come on, man. It's true. Mercy woke you up today. And God gave you one right. Mercy woke you up today, gave you breath so that you'd have one more day to manifest Him and not you. Give up your rights. You're in a theocracy. Canada, didn't it start that way? Theocracy, right? All right. Uh, okay. Wow. Sheesh, where does time go, man? I know, I just, it's, it's not awesome if I miss my plane today. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Do you know that if we got, if I had enough faith to have translation down? Cool. Can I tell you a story about translation? It's not me, but I know, but I know of. I know of a couple that would freak you out. I just want to tell you this real quick, and then I'm going to go somewhere else on the same line. You okay with that? Yeah. All right. There was this guy that was told by God to go to this country, and the man had no money. <laughs> and he went to, he packed his bags, and he went, and he said, I want you to go to this airport. You know, so he's following, like, line-by-line -line instructions, so he goes to the airport. He goes there, and he has no ticket. He has no money. So you've heard the stories where people come up and say, hey, I don't know why, but I'm going to give you this money you're supposed to, right? Which is awesome, right? I mean, that's cool. It's happened to me. It's awesome. Where you have no idea what's going on, then God says, here, I'll help you. Yeah. You know? <laughs> He's a good father. He's awesome. So the guy goes up to the ticket counter, and nobody gives him money. And he's like, this is crazy. He gets up to the desk, and nobody comes up to him, and he, goes, he walks away, and he goes, I, I don't know what to do. And the Lord says, go into the bathroom. So the guy goes in the bathroom. He says, take your bags and go into the stall. So he takes his bag, goes into the stall. He goes in there. He goes, now you can come out. He comes out of the stall, and he's in the very place he's supposed to go. Yeah. That's it, man. Come on, Jesus. That stretches me, see, really big time. Really big time. Really big time. I get the good privilege of, of sharing one of my friends, his name's David Hogan. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Amazing. There's over 600 people raised from the dead in their ministry. It's powerful, amazing. He shares testimonies and I just sit there and cry. Like, it's not so. I mean like, crazy stuff. Like children getting run over by cars, having their heads split open on the road, going up holding the baby and the head coming back together and being healed and walking and everything's fine. And I'm like, God, you got to help me. You know, like crazy stuff. Like I'm talking stretch you so far stuff. Really. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And I've got the great privilege of walking with amazing people. But when I look around me, I'm looking at the same thing here. I'm looking at God's best right here, right now. You're the best that he's got. And if you see yourself through who God created you to be, you'll look in the mirror and you'll see yourself and love you. The first commandment. All the law and the prophets hang on these two. It says, love the Lord your God with everything you are. And love your neighbor as yourself. And it's impossible for you to be able to share with anybody. Reality check without loving yourself. And if you see who you are, you'll realize that God created you in His image and He restored that which was lost. What was lost was love. What was lost was relationship. See, the cross is not something that Jesus came to bring us to reveal our sin. All life we've been taught that Jesus paid a price to reveal our sin. To remove, to, to, because the sin, He came, the cross is for the sin. The cross is, the cross is not a revelation of your sin. The cross is a revelation of your identity. The cross didn't come to reveal that you're such a sinner. Jesus came to restore that which was lost. When Adam fell and Eve fell, they were sons and daughters and fell. Jesus came to restore sonship to the body of Christ. 
If not, you will constantly be heading to the cross thinking of how much of a sinner you are and never realize that the cross crushed and removed and the handwriting of requirements against you was nailed to it, tacked to it, and now you carry one. Jesus didn't come because we were such horrible people. Yes, sin was an issue, but Jesus became sin. He who knew no sin, it says, became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And if we see what the cross really did, we will become what Jesus paid a price for us to be. Listen to me. We're not just a sinner saved by grace. When you come in, you become a saint immediately. You're translated out of darkness and into the kingdom of His light. You cannot be a son and a sinner at the same time. It's a multiple personality disorder. It's a disorder because God doesn't call you that. You might have a time where you slip, but you're not called a slipper. Listen to me very carefully. Sometimes we wake up and, and man, we hope today's not like yesterday. It will be worse when you hope that way. But if you wake up with God fresh and thank God for His mercy that's new every day, your day will be starting out with the Lord. I never wake up and think, boy, how am I going to miss it today? I don't think any of you guys woke up that way and said, man, I hope I don't miss it today. I, I hope we don't drive down the road and say, oh, that's right, I'm a Christian. Oh. <laughs> this thing needs to be renewed and fixed up in such a way where Holy Spirit goes and breathes upon your soul in such a way to where you can never be the same. People say, Todd, what's the greatest miracle you've ever seen? Here it is. A person's life that's completely transformed that looks nothing like what it did before. One that is naturally supernatural. One that's uncondemned and untouched by the world. A soldier that is engaged in self in an army and he's not entangling himself in the affairs of this world. Not by legalism, but by relationship. One that has righteousness inside of them as an internal governor. Because what I said before is by this time you ought to be a teacher, it says. But you need somebody to take you back to the first principles in the oracles of God. That's where we need to start. We need to start with righteousness because that's the very beginning of who we are. As a matter of fact, it says that the just live by faith. I'm not ashamed of this gospel. Romans 1.16 for it is the power of God unto salvation for them that believe. First for the Jew and then for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. From faith to faith. For it is written, the just shall live by faith. So righteousness is something that helps us grow from one level of faith to another level of faith. From another level of faith to another level of faith. It's the same thing that God starts out in 2 Corinthians 3 and says Moses was given the ministry of condemnation. It was the law engraved on stone that had glory. But we have been given another ministry. Not that one. A ministry, the ministry of righteousness, which has much more glory. And it goes through, then it talks about it, and then it gets to 2 Corinthians 3, I think 17. It says, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we all, with unveiled face, not a veil anymore. Why? Because Jesus entered into the holy place. Through a veil, that is his flesh. The veil removed completely. The law, everything gone. Condemnation gone. And we behold as in the mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into what? Into the original image that God created us to be in the beginning. As if we never ate the tree. Transformation. God says that the sanctification process of a Christian, of a son, of one that looks in the mirror and sees who they are, is one that moves from glory to glory. Not bummer to bummer. <laughs> from faith to faith, from glory to glory. It's the same thing. And it's all in looking in the mirror and seeing who you really are. Without a veil on. I'm going to tell you a little story, and then hopefully I can get out of here. Oh my goodness, it's 1235. 
Sorry, are your bellies rumbling? <laughs> oh, you guys are awesome, man. Thank you for letting me come. Thank you. Just thanks, man, for letting me be free and pour out my heart. That's all I know. So if you bring me, I have to pour out my heart. I can't pour out someone else's. <laughs> Sometimes, though, it's a shock. It's like, put, open your heart and let him in, man. I'm going to just share a testimony with you, mine. It won't be long. I've got to get to a point. I want to share with you why I'm sharing what I'm sharing. And if you guys get done before I do, you can go. Love you. I'm sorry for keeping you so long. I'm just saying because when it gets late in service, I've, I forget to say that and people feel bound to stay. You're not bound to stay. You can go. God will still get you. <laughs> Seriously. I promise. See, God loves you. Loves you. Amazingly. Wow. Hmm. I don't know who you are sitting back there. You. Yeah, you. I just, I, I just see brilliance, man, when I look at you. I, honestly, I see a technical brilliance. I see a brilliance that understands one that has gone through a lot of stuff to be who you are. You have really plowed stuff. You are brilliant. Your mind is constantly going and fixing stuff. You are a fixer guy. You get stuff done. Serious, you find bugs in programs and different things. I see the technical end of things on you, but I also see uh, uh, leadership. There's leadership in you, and you're not just a leader over a small place. You're a leader over a bunch of places, like you're a person that goes and balances stuff out and finds out, and people look to you. You're a man like Cornelius. You're, you're one that's under, you're under one of authority, but you understand people come and answer to you. So you have a lot of wisdom, and God's given you a lot of wisdom, how to steward that and how to manage. So there's management on you. There's, I don't know what you do, I don't know who you are, but I just see that. I see you actually going from place to place to place to try to fix the problems that are there and to keep places together. I don't know, but that makes sense to me, man. I just wanted to say that. I don't know who you are, but bless you, man. <laughs> I just I had to say that so I could move on. <laughs> okay, all right. Awesome. Yeah. Wow, okay, so, so I see you over a region, over an area, but I see promotion coming for you to be over more of an area because you've been faithful and, and you've been a steward in what you do. You've been faithful and you're, you're one that carries integrity. And I just bless you, man, bless you. And bless you, man, you're a good man. It's really nice to see you. Uh, just, there's a lot of stuff that you're wrestling with in here, just stuff that you're wrestling with, man. I believe that Jesus wins the wrestling match. He does, man, because he's awesome and he loves you so much, man. I mean, like, so much, dude. Really, I promise, man. Awesome. What's your name? Thomas. Love you, Thomas. Bless you, man. Wow, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus. Okay. <clears throat> Help. All right. I want to, I'm going to, quickly share even quicker than what I was going to five minutes ago before all that started. Gosh. Jesus. See, the problem is when you start prophesying, everybody wants a word so they can't hear you. So get that off you real quick. I got to share some stuff, please, because I can feel the pull thing. And, and uh, I, I separate myself from the pull thing. Jesus. No. I love it. Honestly, encouragement, edification, it's awesome. We, we need that in the body of Christ. We need to pull that and, 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 and become that. That's good. Yeah. <clears throat> Go with you to Matthew 5 real quick. Oh, boy. I'm not doing good right now. <laughs> no. Anytime I go and start to share a testimony at... 20 to, 20 to 1, it's not good. No, I'm just kidding. Hey. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> I tell you, Matthew 5. Everybody can leave but you guys. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Sorry. They didn't hear me. Sorry.
Okay. Ready? I'm just going to read. <clears throat> Matthew 5, 14 through 16. It says, You're a light of the world. A city that's on a hill can't be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp or put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, that it gives light to all that are in the house. Therefore, let your light so shine before men that they can see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I'm just going to read a couple of things here real quick. Oh, my goodness. Ephesians 5, <clears throat> verses 8 through 17. For you were once darkness, but now are light in the world. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but expose them. For it's shameful even to speak of those things which are done in secret. But all these things that are exposed are made manifest by light. Therefore, he says, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See that you walk circumspectively, not as, fool, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, for the days are evil. Therefore, don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Listen carefully. See that you walk circumspectively, not as fools, but as wise. Redeem the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Colossians 1, verse 9. So since the day we heard of it, we don't cease to, to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all the knowledge of His will and all the wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthening, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power for all patience and longsuffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the saints in the light. He's delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood and the forgiveness of sins. Oh my goodness. It's just everywhere in the Bible. When this opens up, it's everywhere. Everywhere you read, I'm like, oh my gosh. Oh, it's in there too. Oh my gosh, it's in there too. It's all about our walk. It's all about where we are, where we live, where we go. It's not about ministry. I don't teach ministry. I teach lifestyle. Because if you need a ministry, you might need it for people to appreciate you instead of realizing that you are appreciated by God. It's important. You don't, you don't need a ministry so that people value you. Oh, you are very valued. You are very valued by God. Watch. The cross isn't a revelation of our darkness. The cross is a revelation of our value. Come on. This is really good. Okay. <clears throat> How many of you have never heard my testimony? The whole room. God. Okay. No, I, I have somewhere I want to get with this, but I want to explain to you a couple of things. Um, I'm just going to briefly go over because some of you have heard it, but it's okay. Testimonies are good. It means do it again. So, so I grew up and was at 11 years old, my mom and dad got divorced and they put me into a boy's home. And the boy's home was run by the Masons. So I grew up in the Masonic homes for about five and a half years of my life. People make a bigger deal out of the fact that I grew up and was raised by Masons than they do that Jesus is on the throne. Because we are very much problem focused. Sometimes we're trying to find devils. And we're using our sword to find devils instead of allowing it to go and pierce our heart to teach us who we really are. So I got out of there. I came home. I, 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 I was just a problem child. I started drug addiction at 12 years old. Five and a half years later, I get out of there very angry at everybody in my life. I came home and my stepdad tried to be my dad and of course he wasn't and I proved that, you know, all that stuff, man. I stole his guns. I would steal his guns and sell them and just a bad deal, man. He ended up daring me, telling me I could never be a real man because real men are Marines. So I said, well, I'll show you and I joined the Marine Corps. I did really good in boot camp. I did. I mouthed off the whole time so they broke me. 
seriously, like, broke me. Made me invincible. So I go, and I'm just a problem. <clears throat> so I, I go home for leave. Everybody's like, wow, Todd, you changed. You're brand new. My stepdad said, I'm so proud of you. My mom said, oh, honey, it's like I have a son I never had. I mean, I was a real problem, man. Like, there was a reason why I got put in the boys' home. Right? It wasn't just because they gave me up. It was because I was a problem. I would shoot out the windows of cars with BB guns going down the road. I would steal everything. I mean, there was times where I was in my, my bedroom at home and I took the records that I had and I threw them and broke every bit of plaster off my wall in my bedroom. Because I could. That's just a little of the torment and stuff that I lived in my life. I just lived that way all the time. So I joined the Marines and, and ended up coming home. I went back and I wanted to go home again and they wouldn't let me, so I left anyway. I went AWOL or UA. I ran away. I came home. I stole a bunch of money in a drug deal and I took my friends and I drove across the United States to Colorado. I got a job as a ski bum out there. I'm running from the law. Running from the Marines, which they find you eventually. So I got pulled over. I got pulled over one time for driving. I had a case of beer, all kinds of bongs and bowls and paraphernalia and weed and everything in the car. They pulled us over and I got all these cops with nine millimeters at my head on the ground. They put me in jail. They extradite me back to, back to the Marine Corps base. They throw me in the brig. I end up getting out of the brig after a good bit of time. I'm sitting on base awaiting orders. They didn't come, so I went AWOL again. So they found me again, they extradited me back, they put me in the brig, now they kicked me out. So I got a bad conduct discharge. Bad. Follows you all the days of your life. All that stuff. Dishonorable, you know, all that stuff. So I come home, <clears throat> I end up getting a job as a sales guy, and I'm just flopping around really bad, man. Just drug addicted and alcohol, everything, anything I can get my hands on. And I meet this girl on a blind date one day, and we end up moving in together, and she thinks I'm a cool dude. And I end up like just tricking her into thinking I really am. Because I was a really good con artist. I was a really good manipulator. I was. Satan's great at that stuff. He manipulates. He cons people. He makes it look really good. Come on. That's what he does. But if there's no appeal of that because you have this, then we don't have an issue. Listen, if the love of God is what appeals to your senses then you won't be tempted out here because you're in love here. What could possibly be stronger than God's love for me? Nothing. But if I fail to see it, I fail to become it. And if I fail to become it, I'm always drawn by this and this and this. Everything looks good unless He looks great. It's really good. Then you, do you know that if I teach you... See, I was a drug addict. I went through rehabs. I went through AA. I went through NA. I went through it all. If I teach you that you're an alcoholic, you have to, you have to fight alcoholism. Hi, my name's Todd and I'm a recovering addict. Hi, Todd. What are you? An addict. What do addicts do? Fight addiction. Forever. What if I teach you that you're a son? What do you have to fight? Okay. It's really good. Do you know if I teach you a sinner, you'll sin by faith? If I teach you that you're a sinner, you'll sin by faith. Because what do sinners do? They sin. What if we're taught that we're sons and daughters? And that God says you're a saint? Whoa, that's scary. Don't call me a saint. Well, my job is to equip the saints for the works of ministry. Not sinners. Come on, man. It's totally scriptural. There's no way out of this, man. Yeah. Well, there is. You can cop out. But it won't give you any... It won't do good for you. You'll spin your wheels and be tormented by you. And it's horrible. <laughs> Serious. So I ended up having a daughter with her. So we had a daughter. And all I did was lie, steal, kill, destroy. And for nine years... I was with my girlfriend, and for seven and a half years, my daughter had a father that couldn't hold a job, that ripped off everybody, that stole from all mommy's family, stole from all daddy's family. Everybody is afraid to be around Todd. They have to guard their pocketbooks, because that, and that's what my daughter knows. So I can't hold a job. 30 jobs in nine years. That's a lot of jobs, man. Right? They're the ones that I can remember. Yeah. That's it. Seriously, I'm not a Christian. I'm an atheist, and I hate Christians. I am, because I never saw Christ in one, so why would I want what you have? Yeah, really. Wow. Really? 
I saw a lot of people that hid inside the four walls of the church and told me why I was going to hell. But I didn't see a lot of people that had the ministry of reconciliation, not imputing the world's trespasses against them, the one that we say we have. It's true. I, I'm all about correction. I get it. I'm corrected by my papa. He corrects me all the time. And if someone sees something in my life that's not right, I will take it to God and thank you. Come on, man. I'm fathered. He fathers me. Best thing you can do is say, God, I'm asking you to father me. Father me, God. You're amazing. I love you. And he's just like, awesome. He wants to father us. What do fathers do? They father. I was being a poor example of that to my daughter. I didn't know how to father. Don't start thinking that my daughter needs ministry because I didn't father her and she's going to have to deal with this one day. What if God dealt with it already? Be very careful because we've brought a lot of stuff in to try to get people free instead of believing that God can really keep them free. We want to help people, but I'm telling you, Jesus is our help, our hope. Okay. You all right? This kind of challenges some stuff, but it's okay. It's the gospel. So nine years into our relationship, I come home one night after a crack deal, because I after a crack binge, because I'm hooked on coke and it's just bad. Everything and anything I could do. I come home and she's gone. And I freak out. And I told her if she ever left me, I'd kill her. I'd kill myself. First I'd find whoever she's with, kill them both, and then kill me. That was my life. That's who I that's how I lived. I was very jealous. So I knew she wasn't with somebody, she just got fed up. It's nine years of torment. Nine years of, I hate you, you're a loser, you're this, you're that, and I, and I destroyed her life. So I went to her stepdad's house to get a gun. I passed by a phone book, and I opened it, and it flipped open to churches. <laughs> and I made a check at one of the 586 churches in my hometown, and I went to this house, or went to this church. I met this guy, and I told him about all my stuff, and he just looked at me, and he's like, let me tell you what Jesus did. And I said, no, you don't understand, man. Listen. He's like, okay, I'm listening. Now let me tell you what Jesus did. And I'm like, because I'm not a Christian. He goes, look, he didn't say invite Jesus into your heart. He said, you need to give your life to God. Your whole life. It's not just about giving him your heart. It's about giving your life as a living sacrifice. You give your life to him. And then when you get born again, God gives you a new heart. It's awesome. So I did. I said, all right, I'm, I'm in. I had no idea what I was into. Really. All I know is I didn't want to kill myself. I went home and I called my girlfriend and I said, and, and Destiny answered the phone, my daughter, and I said, hey, you. I said, how you doing, honey? She goes, daddy, mommy's not coming back. I said, you need to tell mommy that daddy found God. She goes, what's he like? <laughs> I said, I have no idea. All I know is things are going to change. I don't want to kill myself anymore. She goes, Daddy, you can't kill yourself. I love you, Daddy. It's like that, Daddy. Mom came home and she hated me and told me, you hypocrite, now you're going to bring God into this. There is no God. I can't believe you're doing this. She was angry, really angry. I destroyed her life, man. So I had a band that I was in, like a hard rock, one of them heavy bands. Now I like to sing, but it's different. Jesus! It's different. But before it was... Now it's... Jesus. It's good. It's good. He's good. You should see people on those little air tram things that have to take you to the plane when I break out my guitar and bring that in there. In the little, like, shuttle bus. People are like, oh my gosh, what's going on? He loves you, he loves me, yeah. They're like... Some of them on the way out, they go... Serious, they're 007 Christians. Dun, 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 dun. You know why you're laughing right now, right? 
Because the sword's coming. I'm just letting you know. Serious. Because he loves us. It's like aphrodisiac. <laughs> oh, okay. So I got this heavy band, man. And I'm like so excited because I brought Jesus in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what I did. I incorporated him in. And when you incorporate him in, you're in trouble. So I go back and I tell the guys, I'm like, hey, man. It's like Tuesday night band practice is in my basement. I'm like, guys, you have no idea what I did, man. I gave my life to Jesus. Said, what? So I did, man. It's awesome. He loves me. Dude, shut. Wasn't just that. It was blankety, blank, 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 blank. Dude, come on, man. Come on. Come on, man. Take a hit. All right. I'm telling you, Jesus is real. And I'm partying. I'm getting drunk with them. My first practice. At the end, I'm like, I started to sing about Jesus. I started to just talk about Jesus. They're like, dude, knock it off. I'm like, I'm serious, man. Things are changing as we're out. So three of them left. One guy stayed there. He was my best friend ever. Just my best friend, man. The one that was always there. The one that listened to me all the time. Just, you know, guy that bounced stuff off of. And he's like, dude, I don't believe in Jesus, but I believe in you. And I'm like, man, awesome, dude. Thanks, dude. Thanks. Somebody understands. Because Jackie doesn't. You know, she's my girlfriend upstairs. And I'd come down and he would hear me screaming and raging upstairs. And I'd come down the next practice be like, hey, man, God loves you so much, bro. I'd be upstairs, you blanky blank blank blank. I'd come downstairs in 30 seconds. I'd say, hey, man, how you doing? Jesus loves you, man. James 3. The only reason there was James 3 that my tongue was doing that is because my heart didn't know who I was. Because it's out of your heart that your mouth speaks. Change the heart, change your mouth. So I'm just like, I'm going through life, man. I tell man, Jesus, I get intense trying to witness. Jesus, man, it's really real, man. I can't tell you, this is awesome, man. It's awesome. Dude, Jesus isn't real. Seriously, listen, I've been to psychics, I've been to this, I've been to that, yes, but not Jesus, man. Come on, dude, look at the world, look at this, look at that. Come on. I didn't understand how to share with him. All I knew is that he's my best friend. And I'm going through life, man. So for five and a half months, that's how it was, twice a week. And I'm trying to talk to him about Jesus. And I'm the only one that this guy talks to. He's kind of a hermit, kind of a, a quiet guy. He's a stay-at-home dad. He, he has two kids, three and a half and seven and a half. And, and they're, they're, he's a, he's a stay-at-home dad. His wife works, but they already have their house paid off. So it's like they have very small bills. She wanted to work. So he's like, that's an awesome privilege of a dad. So he's, he's staying home with them, and I'm, I'm like trying to talk to him, hanging out with him, partying with him the whole time. Then all of a sudden, like five and a half months go by, and then one night I'm on a real bad crack bench. See, the drug addiction didn't stop. It got intense, and now I was condemned because I wanted to stop and, and couldn't. It was horrible, horrible. So I'm like, man, I'm like... This is crazy. I don't have any money. i got to go get some stuff. So at 1.30 in the morning, I drive out into my hometown. And I went out into the city, and I picked up this kid. And he was down in the heart of the city. I was from New York City, so he's from a big city. He's like 15 years old. I pick him up. I get him in my car, and I said, hey, man, you got anything on you? And he says, yeah. And I ask him what he's got, and I said, I'll take all you got. He's serious. You got all? And I said, I got it all. Got it? And I said, you have the right to remain silent. And I read him his rights. I told him I was a cop. Listen. I did. I read him his rights because I'm ripping this kid off. I'm taking his money. I don't have any money, but it does. drug addiction is horrible. It's horrible. So I have all the drugs in my car. I pull over to the side of the road around the corner, and I said, step out of the car and put your hands on the hood. And he steps out of the car, and as soon as he did, I hit the gas. And he unloaded a 9 millimeter at me from 10 feet away. And every blast filled my vehicle. You have... Unless you've been on the other side of a 9 millimeter from 10 feet away, you don't know just how it sounds on the other end. And the flashes filled my vehicle, and a voice spoke to me and said, I took those bullets for you. Are you ready to live for me yet? Wow. Not many people get that chance, guys. So what you're seeing up here is because of what I've been through. It's not just because I read my Bible. I experience God every day. And that was my first God experience, man. And I went, you know what I did? I did the drugs anyway. 
That voice wouldn't go away. And I couldn't get high all night long. And all I could hear is, I took those bullets for you. I took those bullets for you. Are you ready yet? Are you ready to live for me yet? Are you ready yet? And I go home and I'm like tormented by this voice. It's crazy. So I get home and can't get high. I get home, there's no bullet holes in my vehicle. It's crazy, dude. I go home, I go in, my girlfriend's there, I hate you. I said, I got to go. Three days later, I went to a place called Teen Challenge. I submitted myself to Teen Challenge. I went in there. My daughter was very sad. My girlfriend is glad to get rid of me. She doesn't want to see me, you know? And, and I called my friend Bobby after I got shot at that night, and I told him, I said, dude, I got to go away. He says, for what? I said, I'm going away to a rehab. He goes, oh, oh, dude, good for you, man. Good for you. Finally, you'll get some help. I said, yeah, but this is different. I got to go away for a year. He goes, well, a year? He goes, what are you talking about? I said, it's Teen Challenge. It's not a, just a drug rehab. It's a who I am in Jesus. Jesus is going to teach me. Dude, Jesus isn't real. What are you doing? I said, I got to, man. I'm not even a father to my kid. I'm not even like a man to my girl. And he's like, dude, a year. Man, you don't got to go away for a year. Jesus isn't real. I said, man, he is. And, and I said, I got to go, man. Can I see you like tomorrow or something? Well, I got, I can't, I got this and that and the other thing. So I'm leaving in two days, man. He's like, well, and I won't be able to see you. He goes, well, I, you can, you know, call me. I said, I'm not allowed to call you or nothing. I came and write you a letter outside of Teen Challenge. You came and write letters to people. And he's like, well, look, I'll, I believe in you, man. I'll be here when you get out. We can play together. We can jam, man, when you get home. And I'm like, dude, it's going to be a year, man. He's like, it's all right, man. I don't got anything to do. So I said, all right, man, I love you. So and that's awesome, man. You have a friend like that. So I'm like, go to Team Challenge. I get there. Three days later, I get this phone call. I'm like, I've submitted myself to the program. My, my girlfriend has gotten rid of me. My daughter is sad because her dad's leaving. Three days later, I get a phone call, and the counselor calls me into the office, and he says, Todd, he says, your pastor's on the phone. I said, oh, my gosh. And I'm thinking, my daughter, Jackie, what's going on? He didn't have a good face. He had a sad face. I said, what happened? What's going on, man? He goes, talk to your pastor. He says, Todd, and Dan, he says, you can't leave. I said, what are you talking about? He said, Bobby had a brain aneurysm. Bobby's my best friend, see. So I am like, oh, no! <laughs> He's my best friend. Anybody have any best friends? Anybody have any best friends that aren't Christians? <laughs> Let me tell you something right now. My heart was so wrenched, I wanted to leave, man. And I didn't, and I stayed. <clears throat> and two months later, I had submitted myself to this program. I am in the Word every day. I never read a book before. I had ADHD, so I couldn't read. The Bible is the first book that I can understand. Because it's not meant for my brain. It's meant for my heart. Because yes. your heart can take you places. Your brain can't fit. Your brain cannot fit there. So two months later, I have an encounter with a homeless man one day. He's across the street from Teen Challenge. And I see him pushing his shopping cart. And I, and I said, hey man, Jesus loves you. And he stops his cart and he comes up to me and he goes, do you know how much he loves you? And I'm like, tell me. And he preached the gospel, man, to me. A homeless guy, pushed in the shopping cart. He has like sneakers on, swim goggles on his head, baseball cap, army fatigues, pushing the shopping cart up Main Street in Harrisburg. It's a straight street. He looks at me and he goes, you have a demon in you. He doesn't know who I am. He doesn't even know why I'm there. I didn't tell him why I'm there. He said, I'm praying for you, and this is leaving you. And I'm like, cool. You know, and he prayed for me. I didn't feel anything. I didn't. I said, why aren't you out? Why are you out here? Why aren't you pastoring some church, man? I didn't have a grid for outside of the church. I didn't understand any of this stuff. I said, why? He said, 20 years ago, the Lord told me to pick up my cross and follow him. And I've been pushing this shopping cart across America, going from mission to mission, telling anybody who will listen about my king. And he has the shopping cart full of Bibles. So I go into Teen Challenge and I go to sleep and that night I have this dream where I'm in this valley. And in the valley it's like all grass and steep sides on it. I had these horrible nightmares so I look immediately when I'm in my dream and there's nowhere for me to run. 
and I'm afraid because I have drug dreams and afraid dreams and demonic dreams all the time. So I hear this shaking and rumbling and I hear this voice say, do not fear, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And I woke up and I'm like, oh my goodness. I went back to the prayer room and I opened up my Bible and opened to Psalm 23. And I, and I looked and it says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. And I went, that's God. Next night, same dream. Third night, same dream. Third night, someone touched me on my shoulder and said, go home. This is 10 months early. This goes against protocol because it's a year program. But I heard in my heart, by God, go home. And the fruit in my life will bear witness of whether this is true. So I called Dan. He came up and picked me up. No questions. He picked me up. He, went, he took me home and told me all the reasons why I was going to make it on the way home. I get home. Well, I go to my church first. And then I go home. I go home. And my daughter comes out. She's so happy to see her dad. She says, Daddy, Mommy came to Jesus. It's awesome. It's like awesome. And I'm like, I'm like, really? I said, honey, I can't live here anymore. She goes, Daddy, why? I said, because I'm a man of God. <laughs> she goes, what do you mean you can't live here? Honey, Daddy's a man of God. In order for me to live here, Mommy and I have to be married. She's like, well, why? I said, because I'm a man of God. I'm serious. My heart's so convicted. You have no idea. I live in a place of no compromise, man. You can. You don't have to. You get to. You can. You don't have to live with compromise in your life. You can live with no compromise. You can live in that place. You don't have to compromise your life. You don't have to sell out. Judas sold him for 30. What's your price? You don't have to sell out. It's not legalism. You can't legalistically do any of this stuff. You can't legalistically watch your tongue. You can't legalistically face the trial in, in good, great joy. You can't. But you can see him and do it because you've become it. So my girlfriend comes out and I said, hey, you. She goes, hi. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. I'm serious. She's like, we need to get married. I'm like, yeah. So four days later, in church service, between first and second service, we got married. Nobody was in agreement. I destroyed everybody's life. Except for me, my wife... Holy Spirit and the Father and Dan, the one marrying us. So we get married, nobody is happy. Everybody's angry. They're telling me, at my wedding, you're a loser, you always will be one, you don't fool us. And I'm like, that's okay, and it couldn't hurt me because I will never allow sin against me to produce sin in me because I'm free, see? See, I live with me. You can think what you want. <laughs> this is not a fairy tale. This is not too good to be true. It's so good because God is true. Amen. So we get married and it's awesome. I got a new wife. I've got a new family. And my daughter has never had any memory of drug addiction since day one. Not one memory. Not one, your dad's a loser. She doesn't even remember that at all. It's not just a mental block. It's righteousness where old things have passed away. All things become new. Well, the old man is dead. Not for us to resurrect him again. Not for us to concentrate on the problem, but to focus on the promise and the reality of who we really are. But I have something else that I need to share with you. I need you to listen to this. So we get married, and it's awesome. And Bobby is still alive. He's in a coma. And I don't understand healing. But I do understand this. I was lost, and now I'm found. And I was blind, but now I see. And Bobby is up in a, in a brethren home, it's called. It's a convalescent home. And he is sitting in a hospital bed, hooked up to life support. And he is dying. And he's my best friend. <laughs> the one that I never walked Jesus out in front of. So I went up there to visit him just to say I'm sorry. Now I'm not saying this because I have shame, because I have no guilt, no shame, and no condemnation. I'm saying this because it marked me and it can mark you. 
I went up there and I said, <laughs> I went into the room and his wife is in there. She's not a believer. They believe in ghosts and all kinds of stuff, man. It's just wacko stuff. <laughs> stuff that I used to believe in. And I said, I said, Betty, to his wife, she goes, yeah. I said, can I give you a hug? And I said, she said, yeah. And I gave her a hug and I said, I'm sorry. And she said, for what? And it's because I didn't walk out Jesus. She goes, Jesus? Look at him. Look at him. You're going to tell me about Jesus? And I said, I'm sorry. And I said, I didn't know. She goes, stop saying you're sorry. And so I held Bobby's hands and I said, I'm sorry. I sang, I'm sorry. Because for 30 seconds, man, maybe a little longer, I had the reality of where my life was, walked out before this man. And I realized that I was the only one that had a voice in his life. And to some people, you have a voice in their life. And to choose to be selfish is to condemn them to hell. It's not okay because Bobby died telling me the last day when I talked to him, Jesus is not real, man. And Bobby's in a coma. And I've had lots of people say, well, you know, Bobby can hear you. I get it, but that's not my reality. My reality is that I didn't walk something that I could have. And so I made a heart thing in my life. I let it mark my heart in such a way where I will never be the same. You will never hear of me being a hypocrite. You'll never hear that stuff in my life. Not because I have to, but because I get to. But because I redeem the time for the days are evil. And I'm a son, man. I represent the king of glory. And so I'm in there and I'm singing and I'm sorry. And I held his hand and I looked and he's not home. He's just not there. And for 30 seconds I saw all the things I never did. And I said, God, let me never be the same. Mark my heart in such a way to I never be the same, God. Never the same. I'm a light of the world. I am salt and a preservative. I had the ability to walk as light and didn't. Now I know. And it will never happen again. Mark me and sear this in my life in such a way to where I could never, ever be the same. And he marked me that day. And the next day, Bobby died. My best friend in the whole world. And I'm sad. And I went home. And I said, honey, Bobby died. And we held each other. And we know the reality and the consequences of eternity. I, I know it's all about bringing heaven to earth, but you can live your life in such a way to people that don't know God come to know God because you do. What does it mean to be the light of the world? This is really important. Your job, your workplace, your life is a marking place for you to mark what it looks like to leave a legacy. We're here for a short time. It's not about your bats, your barns. It's not about your building. It's about your life leaving a legacy of what one man and what one woman could do possessed by God. In the face of every adversity. Not being subject to adversity. But living with victory. And so I, his wife called me the next day and said, Todd, you are his only real friend. We want you to speak at his funeral. And I said, oh God. What am I going to say? I saw it in my heart. What am I going to say? He's, he's got two kids. Three and a half and seven and a half years old. So I go to the funeral and I'm like, I don't, I, I'm right out of Teen Challenge. I'm brand new, dude. I don't know any better. All I know is there's a man in that casket that's not a man in that casket. There's a man in the coffin that's not really there. He's in one of two places. And I have a really good hunch to know where he's at because of my life lived. And we don't think that way because we think, well, you know, I don't have this or I don't have that or God didn't this or God didn't that or maybe he will or maybe he won't. Instead of becoming who God says we really are. And just letting God mark us in such a way to where we could actually be light. I'm not preaching at you. I told you the sword's coming. This is real. This is real stuff. I promise you. You will never be the same if you let God have you. Ever. Ever. And I'm looking at Bobby in the casket and they asked me to come up and speak. And I'm looking at the guys in the band are there. The guys that left the band. And they're crying. They're weeping. Because Bobby's not home, man. The reality of death is in their face and in mine. But I'm not guilty or ashamed because God's already marked me. I get it. 
So I preached on what it means to be a friend. And I looked at his little girl and his little boy. And I said, there's one of two places where we go when we die. And I can't tell you that your daddy's in heaven right now. That's a hard thing to do. But that's the truth to this matter. And we say, well, you know, uh, God's working on me. Or, uh, well, you, you don't know. See, people's life are at stake, man. And I just shared the truth and his wife was just zoning out. Not home. And I just preached on what it meant to be a friend. A friend lays down his life. A friend walks out what a friend believes. A friend is a friend of God. A friend is a friend of God. And doesn't, and doesn't try to live his life to make his other friend happy. At the cost of his other friend's life. And I shared the truth about who we are as Christians. And 20 people came to the Lord in about 40 people funeral. Which is awesome. But I had to watch a little girl go up to the casket and say, Daddy. Daddy. And he's not there. And we have the ability to mark eternity with a legacy of what one man or what one woman could do that submitted to a king. That doesn't allow stuff or junk to enter into this place because they're free. 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 Almost every one of my family is born again now. Almost every one of my wife's family is born again. Almost every. I have like one or two on each side out of all of them. Why? Not because of my preach, but because I'm redeeming the time. Because the days are evil. You have the short opportunity and the window of opportunity to walk as light in this world. Don't allow what people have done to you or what you have gone through to separate you from who God says you are. Put your hands on your heart. I'm just going to pray. I don't need an altar call. I just want to pray. It's good. I watched God grip the hearts of people. He's gripped my heart the whole time I'm up here. When I preach this, I preach this out of my life. I'm not preaching this to make you sad or to make you nothing. Okay, there is no guilt. You mark your heart right now and you say, no more. No more. That's all. Okay? I love the prophetic. I love it. But I'm talking about living from this place and allowing all your prophecy and all your healing and all your miracles to come out of this place right here what I just preached today. Okay? Wow. Someone want to play guitar? I'm just going to pray real quick. You don't have to. It's all right. It's awesome. You want to? I just want to pray that God marks your heart. I cannot stay. You guys got to let me go. Okay? I just, you got to. Because I've got, got to go. Please. I preached a long time and I'm sorry. But let this mark your heart in such a way. You guys already got a grip on healing. You don't need me to pray for you. You have it. We're believers. When righteousness hits the mark, all of a sudden, we just are who we are because He paid a price. And you don't need somebody special to lay hands on you. There are many people that are well equipped to pray for the sick. Really. You don't need to, me to give you a prophetic word in order for you to be free. You be free. Because in these last days, God has spoken to us by His Son. Hand on your heart, Jesus. We want to thank you, God, and we worship you for life. We want to thank you, want to thank you. and brand us God mark us with your holy name yeah. rend our heart God tear everything apart we surrender
everything that we are we surrender we were never created for that's us we weren't created for us we're giving ourselves back to you which is our reasonable service holding nothing back cause you didn't hold it back you gave us your son I believe, I believe you are in me cause you want to be. I believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I submit, I surrender, holding nothing back. Shine through me. I surrender, I submit, holding nothing back, cause it's not mine to keep. Freely I receive, now freely I will give. Nothing back, you restored my identity. I can truly live. Jesus, flow through me. Yeah. And when I look in the mirror, I see my identity. Never again will I be condemned. Never again will I be guilty or ashamed. I'm not living for my glory. I'm living to glorify your name. That's the name of Jesus. I'm not living for my glory. I'm not living for my name. I'm here to bring you glory. I'm here to bring you fame. That's the name, the mighty name. The name of Jesus, he lives in me. He restored my salvation. The salvation of my soul, yeah. Now the truth has set me free. He restored my identity as a son. I don't have to war, have to fight, because the battle is already won. To righteousness And I'll never live No Anything less Than this Blessed are those who hunger and thirst For righteousness They shall be filled 
We believe in the finished work. So God, let us be fair. You restored me to righteousness. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. When I look in the mirror, I see Christ inside of me. When I look in the mirror, I see my true identity. The mystery's been revealed So why can't I see Oh, I can see Now I see The real me Cause I've seen you Upon that tree Take upon me My yoke is easy Burn it fly Cause he raised me from the dead and gave me new sight. Father, I just thank you in the name of Jesus, God, for these people. God, I ask you to mark them in Jesus' name. Let them never, ever walk in hypocrisy, nor do they ever think that it's even an option. God, I thank you for grace, God. Grace and peace be multiplied unto these people. Father, I thank you for amazing grace, God that you would bless them and increase your favor and grace upon them. God, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching the video. We came up with a website. It's called Lifestyle Christianity. We have our newsletter that's going to go out. You can sign up for our email list. We also have testimonies on there, event schedule, all that stuff. It'll be amazing. We want to empower our generation to walk Christianity as a lifestyle so we can all walk with the power of God on a constant basis. It's going to be awesome, so come on over. Bless you. Thanks for watching.